Good evening, everybody. We've hit 100 attendees and counting, so I think let's kick things off uh, with this fascinating webinar, the UN's War on Israel, the campaign at the UN to, to delegitimize the Jewish state. We have some great speakers lined up, um, but without any further ado, it's my pleasure to, uh, give, a word of, uh, to give a word of welcome uh, to introduce Anthony Rosman from the South African Zionist Federation. Um, Anthony, over to you. Thank you, David. Um, very excited to, um, to host this session as the South African Zionist Federation um, at the start of the year and uh, what promises to be a very interesting year, um, uh, possibly one of the most accelerated years in terms of the UN's war on Israel. Anthony, um, and may I ask, your camera doesn't seem to be on, won't you quickly turn it on for us? Sure. You check, my apologies. Ah, there we go. Sorry, my apologies. Um, so yes, um, I think that um, this year promises to be an interesting year when it comes to the um, uh, the UN stance in Israel and the, the war in Israel. And um, the Zionist Federation felt it very appropriate to to um, host a session of this nature where we try and unpack. Um, what's happening with the UN, what's happening with the delegitimization or the attempts to delegitimize Israel. Um, and, um, and, and I think this will make for a very interesting discussion. And we have two uh, very esteemed guests with us today. Um, we, we have two people who have um, uh, certainly have uh, amazing credentials when it comes to the understanding of both the UN and uh, Israel issues, as well as the relationship with South Africa. Um, first, we have Anna Bayevsky, who um, Anna is a professor and director of the, of the Torah Institute for Human Rights and Holocaust. Um, she has taught at, at York University, the University of Ottawa Law Faculty, Columbia University Law, and has served with the Canadian delegation to the UN General Assembly from, 19, uh, from 1984 to 1989, um, as well as the Commission for Human Rights from 1993 to 1997. Um, she also served on a number of delegations to, uh, to the uh, 1993 Vienna World Conference on Human Rights, um, in 1995 Beijing World Conference on Women, and the 2001 Durban Racism Conference, something that we would all be very familiar with here in South Africa. She was a member of the External Resource, uh, Research Advisory Committee for the UN High Commission for Refugees from 1996 to 1998, and a member of the advisory panel of the UNDP on the UN Development Report for 2000. From 1998 to 2001, she worked in collaboration with the Office of the UN High Commission for Human Rights on, on a review of the UN Human Rights, um, human rights Treaty System, um, uh, authoring a major report on the reform of the treaty system in 2001. She's a member of the International Law Association Committee on Human Rights, uh, law and Practice, and Editor-in-Chief of the series Refugees and Human Rights, published by Bro. She holds a BA, MA, and LLB from the University of Toronto, and a Master's in Literature from Oxford University, and is a, bar a barista and uh, solicitor on the Ontario Bar. Uh, an incredible, incredible CV, and uh, we welcome you, Anne, to this, uh, to this discussion, and I think everyone is really looking forward to, to your insights. And then we have um, Olga Meshwe, who is no stranger to the South African Jewish community um, and who, uh, who we, we are extremely uh, grateful to have on our show. Um, as some of you may know, Olga is the Chief Executive Officer of the SAI International, um, and Olga has, uh, ha has certainly cut her teeth in terms of relations between Africa, South Africa and Israel. Um, she started off, uh, or, or she, she had a career in law as a partner with, at Weber Wenzel. Um, she then became a director of uh, uh, to lead transformation in Transcend Corporate Advisors, where she advised, advised nonprofit organizations, government organizations, uh, and the like in developing and implementing strategies for socioeconomic development programs that were sustainable, held impact, and changed lives. Um, Olga is a very skilled MC and speaker, certainly has the gift of the gab, um, and has a, a long list of, of, of engagements as an MC and conference speaker. Um, she has a very unique narrative on South Africa, uh, Africa and Israel relations, 
um, a Christian narrative on the Christian mandate to stand with Israel. Um, and she has uh, spent uh, many, uh, uh, many years um, uh, engaging and delivering on this uh, commitment. Um, she is a regular speaker on the South African circuit and the circuit in the United States, um, having spoken at the uh, America-Israel Public Affairs Committee, Christians United for Israel, the World Jewish Congress, the Maccabi Task Force, Students Supporting Israel, um, and Hillel's at campuses across the United States. She has also served as a guest speaker to Stand with Israel, Nigeria, the South African Zionist Federation, South Africa Friends of Israel, um, and other South African Jewish Christian Israel support organizations. Um, Olga has also made an appearance um, on the Christian Broadcasting Network and JBS, formerly Shalom TV. Um, Olga was named by Parable, Parable Magazine in 2011 as one of the most uh, influential young Christian leaders. And in 2016, Olga received the Jerusalem Award from the World Zionist Organization in recognition of her advocacy for Israel as well as the work that she does with the South African Jewish community. Um, she also serves as a regional director and educator for Club Z. Um, and uh, and um, in between all of that, Olga does, um, she has a husband and a child um, and um, serves obviously to her family. Um, so we have two extremely, extremely uh, well esteemed guests and we look forward to your engagement and we welcome you to this platform and welcome to everybody who has joined us this evening. Um, as Benji said, please, um, if you have questions, post them in the group. Um, and over to you. We, uh, we look forward to hearing this discussion. Well, thank you very much, Anthony, for that very gracious introduction to both myself as well as Anne, to everybody that's joined in. Saubona, Dumela, and good evening. It is always such a privilege to be with my home community. Let's get right into it um, with such an amazing expert um, and person, someone that I've been privileged to get to know over the last couple of months. In addition to that very long resume, Anne has done amazing things. She is also the president of Human Rights Voice. And first question for you. Now, it's no secret that the United Nations is anti-Israel. They make that very clear with regards to their bias. We see it from Israel being a standing agenda item on the agenda for meetings of the United Nations Human Rights Council. We see their anti-Israel bias in the number of ridiculous resolutions that condemn Israel for human rights abuses. Never mind the fact that real abusers of human rights get a free pass. So this latest attack by the United Nations, why is this particular one so egregious? Thank you very much, Olga. And uh, thank you to uh, the host of this uh, program uh, for uh, inviting me. And I look forward to speaking to you and to answering uh, the questions you might have. Um, to be short about an introduction, I've been following the United Nations for almost four decades. And from, its, from that perspective that I can tell you that this latest creation of the UN human rights system, human rights in quotation mark system, is the most egregious anti-Israel effort that's ever been launched. Um, there was the Zionism as racism resolution back in 1975, but that was later um, rescinded by the General Assembly, the first ever rescinding. Um, but the, this is operationalized in a way which is dedicated to the destruction of a Jewish state through lethal politics. Now I say that, um, let me give you a little bit of background as to what it is and why we're here. In last uh, spring, there was an 11 day conflagration between Hamas and Israel um, because Hamas had launched uh, approximately 4,300 rockets at Israel, of course, it's grossly a war crime since they were directed at the civilian population without distinction. Um, and that it was a part of their attempted genocide, which they're openly committed, to which they're openly committed in their charter itself. The response of the United Nations was to 
hold an emergency to convene an emergency session at the behest of Islamic states and the, in UN terms, so-called state of Palestine. And the Human Rights Council has this, convenes this emergency session within days. Um, you know, it, it, it uh, takes years, if ever, to, to deal with uh, grotesque human rights violations around the world. But when Israel had the audacity to fight back, the UN Human Rights Council holds an emergency session. And at that emergency session, even though by then uh, there was already a ceasefire agreement, they adopt a resolution, a resolution over the objection of every, every Western state, not a single one voted for the resolution. Um, and it creates a commission of inquiry, a commission of inquiry with the broadest, most uh, expensive mandate because of its longevity over time, it's in perpetuity in the history of the UN human rights system. It's unprecedented in its scope and its substance and so on. So basically, and what's particularly interesting about it is, it didn't have virtually anything to do with the, the, uh, the uh, conflict that had uh, just taken place. It, um, it then opened itself up to create an inquiry on all the root causes of the conflict ever with no start date and no end date. And moreover, they, the UN would end up hiring uh, in order to fulfill this mandate, 18 full-time staff members of the Office of the High Commissioner. Um, I mean, to give you an idea, you know, when they had a North Korea investigation, there was a third of the number of, pe of people that have now dedicated to, to Israel bashing. And um, so they created this uh, mandate, uh, this inquiry, and then they needed to appoint three people. So how did they do that? They turned around and the, the Human Rights Council president, a Muslim um, uh, a diplomat from Fiji, who then appoints three individuals, the chairperson of whom uh, of, is Nave Pele, South African Nave Pele. Now, Nave Pele, as well as the other two people, are notorious for their anti-Israel bias. It's not a secret. Um, her speeches, her, um, her um, uh, activism, both during the, um, the, her, her time as UN High Commissioner for Human Rights from 2008 to 2016, 2014, um, her time after that uh, period, um, in South Africa in particular, um, is well known, as is the record of the other two members. So I'll, I'll, I'll answer your questions, Olga. Uh, perhaps you'd like to go into more detail about the two of them. But the bottom line is that here, this report, this inquiry is forever permanently based at the Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights composed to a great extent by lawyers who are essentially created an in-house law firm to victimize and to delegitimize and to criminalize Israel and Israelis when they act in self-defense. And so um, the, it's a, uh, essentially a four-part plan. Number one, label Israel a racist state guilty of apartheid, number two, because that's a crime against humanity, criminalize Israeli uh, uh, operations and self-defensive measures, take it to the International Criminal Court, three, uh, engage, um, get the entire global community on board with boycott, divestments and sanctions, BDS, and lastly, deny, encourage a complete arms embargo on the state of Israel, so that Israelis can't engage in self-defense. So here we are months away from the first report in this massive global effort to, as I say, 
through lethal politics, destroy the state of Israel, a Jewish state. And if we can just unpack some of what you've said, um, you spoke about the composition of the uh, commission of inquiry, you spoke about how it came about, how it's staffed, the fact that its mandate is pretty much forever. Um, in addition to what you've said, also from some of my readings, would you agree with me that the assessment of this particular inquiry is that it's a farce? There is a predetermined outcome that this inquiry is going to come to. And, and so even as you listed those four points of attack, like what's the point? Is this real or is this a waste of taxpayers, many who are paying taxes through their governments that are then going to be funding this? I mean, other than just being a farce, what is this? Well, um, I'm, it's very savvy, it's not a farce. It is a pogrom. I've called it Pele's pogrom because she's leading the charge. Other ways of putting it are a star chamber, a witch hunt, a global witch hunt. And for far too long, um, the United Nations has been dismissed as a you know, there, it's not a serious organization. It's, it's fall, it, it, it falls terribly short from protecting, from it completing its mission of peace and security, obviously, and it's, um, and protecting human rights so that we don't have to take it uh, too seriously. We can assume that other people will understand that this is biased, but that's not the way it's, uh, uh, things have played out, and we do so at our peril. I said there's a foregone conclusion because the resolution itself, the mandate, um, is um, uh, indicates exactly what will transpire. They, is, as I said, it was supposed to be in the context of an emergency situation vis-a-vis -vis Hamas rocket attacks. Um, and Israel's response, but instead they, they, uh, the mandate talks about an April 13th date, they say, before and after April 13th. Well, I had to look up what that was because it didn't have anything directly to do with the conflict. And they said, but it turns out that it was the beginning of Ramadan and an effort by uh, Muslim uh, Palestinians to in fact, uh, to riot, and to, uh, to claim, as has been true over history since the Mufti of Jerusalem back in the 20s, to claim that somehow Jews were preventing uh, Muslims from access to prayer. Of course, the inverse is true. Between 1948 and 1967, when um, Jordan controlled um, the, um, the old city of Jerusalem, uh, Jewish gravestones were used for uh, latrines, for, pit, for uh, stone pathways. Um, there was no access of any Jew to the holiest uh, uh, site of, of the temple, the, destruct, the destruction of the Semkin temple and the wall. Um, and um, similarly, Christians have uh, access to holy sites uh, and freedom of worship has been protected through Israel, but not uh, when, in fact, Arab and uh, Muslim Palestinians and Jordanians uh, had, had uh, greater control. So the facts are clearly um, the inverse of what the UN is uh, saying, but to start this pogrom with Ramadan and then to say there are no temporal restrictions because the point is to go to revisit the creation of the Jewish state and to, um, to condemn it as somehow racist in and of itself. So the dangers cannot be overestimated. The time for us to do something about it is now. Also, of course, since the International Criminal Court and its effort to uh, criminalize um, the uh, Israel's actions, is uh, of, of serious danger because it changes the subject from <laughs> the offender to the defender. Um, and um, it really, it, it, the, the um, 
letting it go on without a response uh, is it would be a terrible mistake and um, we are all called upon to do something about it. Thank you for clarifying the fact that it's not a forest, it's, it's a witch hunt, it's a program that requires our, our urgent response. And um, I have a question for you on that, but before I ask you that particular question, as you've already alluded to in relation to the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem um, in the 1920s and just various other accusations that have happened over the years, false accusations, the manipulation of context, truth is something that unfortunately is uh, common as it pertains to the state of Israel. And one of the accusations, the false accusations is a liable that Israel is an apartheid state. And you're speaking to a community that is very familiar with apartheid, um, non-whites in particular having suffered through and, and understand its brutality. Please, can you take us through the history of the use of this libel that Israel is an apartheid state at the United Nations and how it's been weaponized as an agenda against the state of Israel? Well, it began, you know, um, the apartheid uh, lie uh, began as, as long ago as the late 60s, early 70s. And um, of course, the United Nations General Assembly adopted the Zionism as racism uh, resolution. And then the Human Rights Com the Commission on Human Rights uh, had two standing agenda items about uh, two states, which were allegedly the most egregious states in the world, uh, South Africa, apartheid South Africa, and Israel. And um, there were world conferences of the United Nations, uh, which adopted the General Assembly's resolution that Zionism is racism throughout the 70s and 80s. And, um, but then South Africa um, uh, overthrew apartheid and the, um, the Israel was left as the, uh, on the UN human rights agenda. Now in 1991, the General Assembly rescinded the Zionism as racism, appalling lie, which is after all to suggest that the only uh, peoples on earth who have uh, the self-determination of the only peoples on earth uh, uh, to be called racist are Jews. So this was a, a, a renunciation of the very raison d'etre of self-determination that the United Nations purports to, um, to, to represent. So it was rescinded. Um, so then Israel's enemies looked around to continue the racism lie. And since they came up with the Durban formula, there was, as you, uh, many of your, our listeners will be well aware, a global anti-racism conference held in Durban, South Africa in 2001. And at this conference, um, there was grotesque anti-Semitism all around. I was a representative of the International Association of Jewish Lawyers and Jurists. Um, we had to um, uh, uh, go to the um, JCC, the, the Jewish Community Center, to meet, uh, uh, to have um, certain kosher meals and to, 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 uh, and to think about what was going on. We held, uh, like other NGOs, a session on anti-Semitism, which was the only one of all the so-called victims groups that was broken up by a screaming uh, mob yelling, you are killers, you are killers. Um, we were told by the uh, Durban police force, uh, the South African police force to vacate the JCC because a, uh, a mob uh, of marchers was uh, coming close to us and our, we were in mortal danger. So, and when in the end days of the, the NGOs adopted this um, declaration claiming Israel was an apartheid state, et cetera, et cetera, um, the, uh, the Jewish community members that were there, including myself, were, had to be immediately accompanied off the grounds, the meeting grounds, because our, we were in uh, physical danger. So that was the environment of Durban in that context where um, the human rights representatives included uh, Fidel Castro and um, Yasser Arafat. Um, 
The declaration said that, that Palestinians were victims of Israeli racism. The only country on earth that was supposedly racist was uh, named in the Durban Declaration as the State of Israel. Now, it was at the time, we were able to draw attention to the grotesque anti-Semitism. But 9-11 happened three days later. And I was actually in New York three days later. And um, I went immediately from Durban to move to the United States from Canada. And um, I witnessed 9-11. And anybody who saw the hate at Durban and the, the destruction of 9-11 couldn't help but connect the dots. This is not about speech for its own sake. This is speech directly connected to violence and terror. And so, so what happened after that? Nave Pillay became high commissioner. She was from Durban, South Africa. And she took it upon herself to resurrect, as the mayor of Durban told her when she was appointed, resurrect the good name of Durban. She made it her calling. It's, it was her number one task as, uh, that she took upon herself. So she hosted and she created two subsequent Durban conferences, Durban II in 2009 and Dur Durban um, uh, three in 2011. And both of those UN meetings reaffirmed the Durban mantra. So that's what, Na and Nave Pelli herself held a news conference, which is available on the internet, um, where she said, of course the Palestinian paragraphs have been reaffirmed. So it wasn't a secret. We knew what she was about. And then, and then what happened? So during her time in office, there was the 2008 and 2009 um, conflict. Uh, Palestinians were, Hamas again was engaged in um, uh, rocket attacks on, this, on, on Israelis at the end of 2008, 2009, gave rise to the Goldstone Report, another South African. And Goldstone came up with a report um, which said that Israel was deliberately targeting civilians. It's a blood libel. Now, subsequently, Do Goldstone said, rescinded that, said he shouldn't have said it and he wouldn't have said it if he was asked to do it, uh, to do so today. And what did Nave Pele do? She actually went on the offense, supporting the original allegation. And then she spent her time in 2014 Again, all inter information available on the, on the web, it, uh, proving, I mean, or uh, alleging that Israel was deliberately targeting uh, women and children, the innocent. And so, um, so that uh, it is nothing short of mind boggling that this is the, the UN has rules for inquiries. Number one, impartiality. Every expert appointed has, must be impartial. They must be independent. They must be, um, they, yeah, they, uh, independence, impartiality, and uh, well, I'll, I'll think of the other one. <laughs> it's almost, the impartiality is enough. But um, the, the, the thing is, in these requirements, um, the Nave Pili obviously doesn't satisfy any of these criteria. And yet she is heading this delegate, this, this inquiry now. So I think um, that what's important to understand is, um, oh, I should say, I know what the other one was, objectivity. Can you imagine that? Objectivity, having already decided that Israel is engaged and has done all of the various things that this inquiry is set to so-called investigate. So, um, so having said that, we know what's going to happen, but what can we do about it? Here we have a situation where the outcome is clear. We could write it right now. Um, so, and so, uh, well, I mean, I, I don't wanna preempt you, but I mean, I think what we have to ask is, um, given who's, who's heading it, the mandate, the way it was created, the context, the environment, the wording of, of, of what the, 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 the inquiry is tasked to do. Um, we, we know that this is a, an, uh, Israel's an imminent danger, real danger.
of, of delegitimization through this apartheid lie. And to, to answer your question, it was Pele who made the racism, the apartheid lie, the centerpiece of her time in office and who continued to champion it uh, after the fact. So we, we move seamlessly from 75 to, uh, to, new, to the Durban conference in 2001 to Nave Pili, Durban two and three, and, um, and her appointment to, 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 to lead the charge uh, into, in 2021. Listening to you speak, um, it's easy for somebody to become quite disheartened, uh, especially South Africans, when you recognize how our history and our experience by virtue of apartheid has been used against Israel, but also how a South African and um, together with other South Africans have actually spearheaded the continued anti-Israel hate and, and particularly with regards to this agenda, the Commission of Inquiry. Um, and also, as our audience will know, how our government has unfortunately been at the forefront of wanting Israel to be removed as an observer at the African Union. With all of these various things where we see South Africa taking a prominent role in the anti-Israel agenda, even though the very vast majority of ordinary South Africans are not anti-Israel, and what can we do? What practically can we do in relation to this commission of inquiry, which you've already mentioned, is a witch hunt, is egregious, is, is going to have implications politically for Israel that we are yet to see. Is there really any hope? And if there is, please take us through the steps that we can do to come against this. The answer is uh, an emphatic yes. There is something we can do and we should do. Uh, and the Commission of Inquiry, so-called the Inquisition, has called for submissions. And what we need to do is to make a submission. Submissions in the thousands and um, in the hundreds of thousands, in the millions. But the point is that each and every one of you, your groups, your organizations, your voice matters. And it, we cannot leave it for a situation where Pele and um, um, uh, the, the uh, Chris Sadati and uh, her and the other uh, member from Australia and from India um, have the last word. They, they throw up their hands and they say, well, well, we didn't hear anything else. We didn't know any better. We had, we didn't know, you know, to obscenely re to refer back to the Holocaust. We can't let this, we didn't know, we had no idea excuse um, be used anymore. And this is the time to make sure that the facts are out there. If submissions need to be made, not because we think that Pele and company will be convinced um, not to be anti-Semitic, not to, to uh, delegitimize a Jewish state, um, not to lie about Israel's uh, intention in defending itself through blood libels, not because we don't anticipate that whatever we do say will be twisted, ignored, taken out of context, but because we're appealing to the court of public opinion. We need to delegitimize the delegitimizers. That's their goal. Our goal should be to tell the truth, to make the facts available uh, to the UN and to uh, whether they wanna listen to them or not, to may be able to say that we gave them the information that they turned around and ignored and, uh, and twisted out of context, to be able to reach media and ordinary people who are open enough, open-minded and want to hear what me, uh, the, the, the actual facts. So if I may, I have set up in my website, um, which is, um, I think we'll be putting it online. Uh, it's uh, www.humanrightsvoices.org. That's the homepage, which changes every day, except for the four boxes at the top. And if you go to Pele's pogrom at the top box, 
you will come to a um, a series of things which are constantly being kept up to date, but are the background information for you, the mandate, the budget, et cetera, the membership. Um, and um, uh, so those are the background. If anything I, I said is in here, the articles are in here, there's everything is repeated so that there's no problem with access or you didn't take notes or you didn't see it or hear it or so on, you can share it. But then if you up bottom right, it says the word submissions. If you go to submissions, um, you can see that what we've created is a template. So here there is a template. You're not going to click, click on it right now because it's a Word document and the guidelines are on the left. And they tell you any tips as to how to make submissions. But that template, all you have to do is fill it in. Now, if you scroll down, the question is, I'm just going to stop with this right here. Uh, if, if you scroll down a little bit, um, it says the deadline. For, oh, I'm going to go back to who should submit. People are so discouraged. You know, they th I think you have to be a, a great expert on, uh, on, um, on history, on, um, oh, I don't know, a political scientist, a lawyer, a specialist of one kind or another. That's not true. It's important to understand that there are no pre-qualifications. You're a student, you you're experiencing discrimination. Um, you're a Christian, you visited Israel and had access um, uh, under Israeli protection, Israeli guards. You're someone who's uh, visited Israel and understands the, the, the apartheid lie and why it's a lie. Um, you experienced uh, apartheid, um, Truly, uh, what it was, your family did, um, and um, the because the other side is attempting to appropriate your history, your history, your experience, and you're the only ones, especially South Africans and uh, perhaps other Africans um, or people of African descent, who can. Um, who are able to, uh, to speak with an authoritative voice. And so uh, the deadline, when do, you, when do you put in submission? The first report is out in June. It's the most important because it sets the stage for all the rest, even if, it, even if they are in perpetuity. And um, there'll be another report to the General Assembly in the fall. But these are the important, if it's in June, they need to receive submissions in time where they have no excuse to say that they, they didn't get your submission in time, which means you should put it in by the end of February. You've really got about literally three weeks, three to four weeks to make a submission for which they will have no excuse to say they couldn't have heard you should they have wanted to. So there is only a, one qualification. If you go down to the word topics, um, the inquiry requires that any submission be on one of five subject matters. Otherwise, they'll have an excuse to throw it out. Well, it wasn't on topic. It isn't within our jurisdiction and so on. These five topics are absolute. There's nothing you do that has to do with anti-Semitism or anti-Zionism uh, or apartheid and what it really means that isn't that doesn't fall within the mandate. So. Don't be scared off by that. The first one, uh, I've got five bullet points here and I put them on the template so it's very easy. Underlying root causes of recurrent tensions, instability and protraction of the conflict, system systematic discrimination and repression based on national, ethnic, racial or religious identity. So, you know, there's nothing in here that doesn't count um, in terms of denying the truthfulness of the allegation that um, that Israel is a is somehow a racist state as opposed to a Hamas which is has a charter that is committed to genocide a Palestinian authority that pays Palestinians to kill Jews um, a um, and one could go on and on and if you look at bullet point number three it's really distressing it says identification of those responsible. That's why I call it a, um, a star chamber. If you, if you, so from your point of view, 
who are you going to identify? Well, are you familiar with people that are um, that, that that incite violence, that that uh, make false allegations of racism, that uh, are inciters uh, uh, on campus, in 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 your communities, in your parliaments, um, uh, in the media? Um, every single one of those people can be identified as contributing to the protraction of the conflict, um, uh, to the uh, encouragement of repression and uh, on the basis of religious identity, on the basis of, of, of being a Jew, or for that matter, being a Christian and attempting to visit Israel and so on. So, or fulfill certain uh, biblical um, scriptures. Um, so if you scroll down from that, it, I, 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 the question is where to send your submission, which again is in the template so you don't have to be concerned or the guidelines. But here, as you see where to send, there should be three places you send it. One is an email address, which I've given you from the UN. Number two, they've asked for a submission on a cloud service, which they're using. And number three is to human rights voices or if you have your own organizations, you can collect them yourself. Because what's terribly important is that when they ignore it, the world can't. We are going to put on the web uh, uh, names with permission, of course, names and, and, and submissions, um, which will, be, uh, which will uh, put the lie to any attempts to suggest that the other side wasn't making themselves heard or didn't attempt to make themselves heard. But if you go to that cloud link, uh, you can see it there. You just click on that. And we're not going to send anything in, but just look at it for a minute. Anonymous upload. This is what a star chamber is all about. You don't have to say who you are. You don't have to say what your expertise is. You could, in, in theory, where it calls for identification of those responsible, put a name in there, a person from your Zionist organization. A, 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 um, a pastor from your church, a member of a committee that you that you uh, find annoying, a person on campus attempting to stand up for the rights of Jewish students. Um, your name, every single one of you that's listening to this could have your name put in here anonymously and sent in to this witch hunt, this star chamber with an accusation that you contribute to the protraction of the conflict, that you're an oppressor, that you're a repressor of Palestinian rights, so-called. So if we go back to, uh, I think that's the end of it, but uh, of the screen sharing, I, I mean, but what I'm trying to tell you is that to underestimate how vicious, lethal, destructive, um, this campaign is, and the way it's been organized, is 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 is, is a tremendous disservice and um, uh, terribly dangerous. And the voices I would venture to say that matter more than any other are South African voices. Your experience, your knowledge, your understanding, um, your firsthand uh, statements. Um, uh, it, it is are unlike any other. So I would encourage you to make your voices heard. Thank you so much, Anne, for that. I do know that the organizers of the webinar will be sharing the link together with a recording of this so that we can all make sure that we do something. Um, at this point in time, I'm going to hand over to somebody that I consider a friend, also somebody that I think the South African community is very blessed to have. He is the Director of Public Policy at the South African Zionist Federation, Mr. Benji Shulman, and he is going to facilitate for a couple of minutes Q and A, and then we'll hand over to two other important voices as we wrap up this webinar. Thank you again, Anne, for your selfless time. Thank you, Olga, and uh, thank you, Anne, for that very illuminating uh, discussion on the very real risks that uh, we face, not just as Israel, but um, world jury and, and supporters of Israel around the world. And I can say definitely that from the South African Zionist Federation side, we are going to be doing whatever we can to collect uh, from organizations, from uh, individuals, uh, the, exactly this that you're, that you're asking. 
because I do think that it's vitally important. And as you say, as South Africans, we can't afford to have um, we can't we can't afford to have apartheid really taken away from us, uh, and we can't allow on our watch for South Africa to be used in this way like it was done in Durban, uh, and and has been done even by our government, unfortunately. Um, with that, let me get into the questions um, and 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 talk to you about them. One of the questions which which I have and which I think perhaps you can um, uh, you can clarify is that when the UN is using the word apartheid, they, they often you'll hear them use the word the crime of apartheid and not uh, apartheid. And and my understanding is that those are two different things. Uh, and that the, the the UN is using them in, in, in sort of interchangeable ways, but they're actually different. And I wonder if you care to comment on on how the notion of apartheid is being distorted in this process. Well, honestly, I think that the two individuals who will join us shortly um, from South Africa are best placed to, to speak to that. But all I would say in general terms is that the UN, um, it's obvious there is no apartheid in Israel um, uh, in terms of here you have a country where um, Arabs sit on the Supreme Court uh, our ambassadors and represent the state of Israel abroad uh, voluntarily, uh, if they wish to do so, can serve in the IDF, uh, the Israel Defense Forces, and who um, in uh, currently are actual a political party represented uh, in the uh, ruling governing coalition in Israel. I mean, the apartheid lie is is so obviously um, uh, illegitimate that uh, and untruthful that um, the U UN is, is, is putting itself, I should say, bending itself into knots to figure out in what shape or form can they make use of the word, which of course is a, rightly a trigger for, um, for our moral outrage and uh, direct that towards Israel. Um, they want to do that because uh, because apartheid is a crime at the under the International Criminal Court. They want to haul Israelis before the International Criminal Court because if you can criminalize the country, well then the rest of it follows. Of course, it's it's illegitimate. An apartheid state is illegitimate. The the people who run it are criminals boycott divestments and sanctions is the only solution um, short of military victory and uh, an, an arms embargo will ensure Israel has no military victory. So um, that's the formula. That's why they're doing it. Um, but the details as to why it's, uh, it's, it's, it's cultural and historical misrepresentation and appropriation is something that I think others should speak to yeah I, I think so if i could just maybe add on to that question in terms of the international law element of it i understand that there is a convention against apartheid um and and that there's the the way that it's used there is, is a little bit different as well do you care to, to comment on that because my understanding is that part of it will be on that level there's no doubt that they're going to try to make uh to to take law and uh invert it and twist it and make something up about which it doesn't say. Um, so that's a, a very long legalistic discussion about why, but the bottom line is um, it was not, uh, this is not the circumstances are not satisfied in, uh, in the case of Israel. And, um, but absolutely no doubt uh, they're trying to, um, cast themselves as somehow um, anointed, a halo, uh, the veil, as whatever you want to call it, of, uh, of legalizing the conversation in a way which uh, is clearly disputable and in factually incorrect, legally and factually incorrect. Could you also comment about the, the, the UNHCR and this process that's going to be ongoing? You mentioned the ICC on, on a couple the, the of occasions. The UNHCR is the, 
UN High Commission for Refugees. Sorry. <laughs> yes, the refugee. This is the Human Rights Council. I apologize. Yeah. Um, how do uh, the how does how does this process connect with what we're seeing at the at the ICC? Because we have seen a lot of uh, work around that as well. Uh, is is it likely to 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 inform and and how long could that take? Oh, absolutely. This is a this is a, um, a setup. This is a, a a clear process. You have Durban. You uh, draft the International Criminal Court statute in a way which uh, supposedly makes Israeli so-called settlements uh, a violation of the Treaty of Rome of the Rome Statute. Um, so you have a law in quotation marks, set up for a party of one, which uh, is actually the inverse of what the rule of law is all about. Then you have the Durban uh, spectacle and Israel's a racist state. Then you uh, have the, the uh, uh, apartheid uh, in, the, um, in the Rome statute, and you have a series of events. What's so sad about this is that Palestinians are actually being used um, as tools to destroy um, Israel. Uh, they're used as human pawns by their leadership. Um, uh, many of them believe them. They voted Hamas in, but uh, we know that there hasn't been an election in, uh, in so-called state of Palestine for over a decade. So, um, so you have a situation where, uh, and Palestinians are used as human shields uh, by Hamas and Islamic Jihad and so on. So that what you, you have this sort of um, line lineage between the effort to destroy the state of Israel from the minute of its birth in May, 1948, and the understanding by the human by the Palestinians and their and the enemies of Israel that the human rights was really their golden ticket, which was a way of and especially the racism allegation, and so um, it's all connected. And in the last year, we saw Human Rights Watch come out with the apartheid lie, then the the uh, almost this. Um, uh, the, the 11 day war, which then gives rise to a resolution which is completely open ended and has not virtually nothing to do with the war, to uh, Amnesty International's report, leading up to there's going to be another report from a UN special rapporteur in March that will say the same thing, will parrot the same thing. And then the piece de la resistance is, uh, is Pele's report herself. So yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's, a, it's a setup and um, that's how it's happening. And that's why we could write it today. A number of people have asked a similar question. So I'm gonna sort of take Mark and Colin and Anthony have all sort of asked a similar question. So I just want to sort of, um, I'm gonna summarize it. If I get it wrong, guys, you, you're more than welcome to, to put in again. But a lot of questions about sort of the appointment of Pelé as an objective, um, objective in, in inverted commas person and, and what you were talking about about the fact that she's clearly not so what kind of uh, information or, or requirements would, would, would one need to uh, not be there uh, if, if, her, if her objectivity is so clearly limited in this context and also uh, inside the UN itself is there not some way to object to this uh, as a kind of procedural issue or um, in, in some other way uh, to, to, to slow the process in, down inside the institution, because what you're asking is effectively us to be part of the process, but basically from the outside. Uh, the answer is that um, the Human Rights Council is overseen by the General Assembly. Um, the General Assembly could, in theory, do something about it, um, but uh, they could have rejected the proposal for a commission of inquiry. They could have refused to fund it, for example. But the General Assembly is, I'll just go back to the Human Rights Council so you understand it, 47 members. The uh, majority uh, are the members of the African and Asian regional groups. They hold their 26 members, 13 among them, between them. That's the majority of the council. And the largest single uh, 
uh, or the, um, the uh, Islamic states, members of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation are the majority of members of both the African and Asian regional groups. So they hold the balance of power at the Human Rights Council. So we have a Human Rights Council that consists of countries like China, Cuba, Libya, Qatar, Russia, Somalia, Venezuela. So that's who does human rights from the UN, the UN's top human rights body. Okay, so they produce this inquiry, this witch hunt and so on. So it goes to the General Assembly. So then what happens? The General Assembly is composed of 193 countries, approximately 119 of them are members of the so-called non-aligned movement, the NAM. The largest, sing in other words, the majority, the largest single voting bloc within the NAM is the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, the 56 member states of the, of the OIC. So, they're, so they, when it comes to these types of uh, issues in, in the Middle East, um, control the NAM, which in turn controls the General Assembly. So no, there's no changing the General Assembly. And indeed, at the end of, uh, uh, the end of December, they voted to fund this, uh, this inquiry. So from within the UN, they ha you have these requirements. Um, one could ask for a legal opinion, for example, from the uh, legal advisor's office within the United Nations as to how these three people, this um, uh, Nave Pele and um, uh, her, her compatriots, um, Milun Kotari from India and Chris Sadati from, from uh, Australia, how they uh, satisfy, which they don't, the criteria for independence and partiality. And if I'm to read it, the, the mandate holders are, must uphold the highest, I'm quoting it, the highest standards of impartiality or of the council is bound to ensure criteria of paramount importance, independence, impartiality, and objectivity. So of course they don't satisfy it. But, um, uh, but the, the, the truth is that the, um, and there have been appeals to the secretary general to weigh in, but he doesn't control the secretary, the, the general assembly. He could weigh in on a, on a moral level. He could express his shock and uh, unhappiness that this pogrom is, is carrying on. Um, but A, uh, he, would, uh, he would be prevailed upon uh, not to do so. Uh, I don't think he has the moral uh, gumption to, to, to say such a thing. But also, uh, the, the bottom line is he doesn't control the G8, so the General Assembly, so that uh, it won't get defeated from the outside. What will defeat it is from the inside and to prevail upon governments, democratic governments, to vote against um, uh, its um, whatever it, it comes out with in, in both in June and in the General Assembly, because they'll, the report will be the first step, then there'll be a resolution accepting it, and so on and so forth. Thank you for that explanation. It's um, very, very in-depth. Uh, and, and quite a complicated uh, issue. Uh, in, in, there is uh, a number of, of questions as well about uh, Israel's participation in, at the UN as a whole, uh, and also you've mentioned governments sort of voting against this. So, so some questioners are asking, where do world governments stand on this, uh, the, the US, Canada, et cetera? Uh, how, how are the governments stacking up when it, when it comes to this particular issue? Well, the vote in the Human Rights Council was 24 in favor, nine against, and 14 abstentions. So the United States was not a member, otherwise it would have been 10 against. But, you know, the, the, uh, the, the 14 abstentions ought to be an embarrassment to countries like France, Italy, the Netherlands, Poland, you know, countries who have a Holocaust record for which you think that they would recognize modern anti-Semitism but they abstained. Um, nevertheless, the 24 in favor do not include a single Western democracy. So it went to the General Assembly. The General Assembly's vote uh, was to fund it. The, um, the actual uh, numbers of the funding vote was uh, 125 against, 
sorry, uh, Israel put forward a, an amendment to deny funding. That amendment failed. On Israel's side were eight countries. Against the Israel amendment to defund were 125 and 34 abstained. Okay, so that tells you the, it's a math situation. Israel doesn't have the votes and democratic countries don't have the, uh, the courage, I'm gonna put that politely, <laughs> to do the right thing. So. Um, okay, sorry, thank you. Uh, I'm just having a look at, uh, at our time here. Uh, I just asked my panelists, we do have time for one more question. Um, from a perspective of uh, the, the issue of a, a apartheid and, uh, and 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 how it's applied again by these reports and and all this sort of thing, there's a question of of is there a distinction made between what happens in the territories in terms of these reports, or or is this being targeted at Israel as a whole? How in in terms of how we're seeing the this thing being structured. Uh, people are wanting to know where the target is. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, this mandate is now completely open-ended and even the title of it is um, to uh, not the, um, the great, uh, I mean, just to get the exact phraseology. Well, in the bottom line is the so-called uh, Palestinian, uh, occupied territory, including East Jerusalem and in the state of Israel. So they purported to take jurisdiction over everything. And moreover, uh, the Commission of Inquiry itself has actually just, has recently issued a guideline for people when they're making submissions and I'm reading it. The commission interprets the mandate as having no temporal restrictions. So they're going back to uh, the beginning of the state of Israel, uh, the modern state of Israel, that's their idea. Um, and uh, it, it's, the whole thing is, is uh, completely open-ended. River to the sea is, uh, is how they would put it, because it's, it's, it's really about the destruction of the state of Israel. However, from your point of view, you can turn that around. The Christians who are listening can turn it, or and Jews for that matter, can talk about the, the biblical uh, relationship between Israel, uh, modern Israel and, uh, and Jerusalem and, the, and so on. Um, and the connection between Judaism and, and uh, the, the Jewish land talk about who the real indigenous people are of the, of, uh, the, of uh, the Jewish state. So um, they've opened it up and uh, we can respond in kind. Wow, okay, thanks. And that is uh, really, really insightful. And, and I think a lot of uh, people have really had their minds open this evening on, on the dangers and the, and the threats of this. Uh, I am going to move on now to our, our second final speaker for the evening. Uh, we're very, very blessed to have on uh, Pamela Ngobane. Uh, I noticed that there's a number of, um, of, of people on this panel with good South African political yichas. Uh, they come from, from famous families, and it's not just one family, there's a few. So uh, Pam is part of that as well, which is great. But uh, even apart from her family background, Pam is uh, a historian and uh, did her BA in historical studies at the University of Cape Town uh, and a post uh, with a postgraduate certificate in education from WITS uh, and also an honors degree in historical studies from the University of uh, Pretoria. And she is, uh, as well as being having two children and working in the education space, she is also a the general manager of the South African uh, Friends of, of Israel and works uh, to create partnerships between South Africans of all walks of life um, and believes that great things can be achieved through friendship and partnership with the state of Israel. And I think we're definitely going to need um, uh, some, some friendship and partnership 
uh, here with us tonight. Uh, Pam, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Would you like to um, would you would you like to give us your perspective, please? Okay, I just want to thank Anne and Olga for this very insightful conversation. We need to have more of these because people need to be educated and understand just how dire the situation is for Israel if we don't do something. And and we, as Safi, we're going to make sure that um, people get access to your website, access to the submission, and we're going to facilitate people's making these submissions. It's very important, you know. Um, but, you know, I know from my own experience that Israel is not an apartheid state. You know, I would never have dreamed of seeing someone who looks like me as an ambassador for South Africa abroad. And yet Israel's diplomatic core represents its entire demography. You know, so there's so many things that could be said about how it's just a libelous lie. But, you know, these are the things that we need to teach the South African people. Um, and as a Christian, you know, Zionism, it falls in line with what the Bible says and what our mandate is as Christians. And, you know, it's a huge indictment on the Catholic Church and, and, and on the denominations that came from the Reformation that anti-Semitism has emerged from these churches, you know, and that anti-Semitism has emerged as a Christian phenomenon. So as, as a Christian and to other Christians, we need to reclaim the narrative of Christianity. You know, Christian Zionism is not an option, it's biblical. It is in the Bible, you know, so I encourage everyone read your Bible and see why the state of Israel needs to be supported. Okay, and I mean, if, if we believe the Bible and we believe that the Lord God does not cast a shifting shadow, that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So when he says he loves Israel forever, that he will bless Israel forever, that Israel is the apple of his eye, are we going to dispute with the Lord? He says in the book of Job how futile that is. So. And as a Christian, you know, I, I was born again very recently. And it was in that that I actually started to learn about Israel. Before I was completely oblivious. Um, I thought I knew the Bible, I didn't. And, you know, simple things. The Lord Jesus Christ, he's called the lion of the tribe of Judah. Judah is the root word of Judaism. You know, so these are things that we need to think about seriously. This is not a game. You know, it's not optional. It's the truth. When, you, when we, we were born again, we were baptized in Christ. We joined this spiritual war that we are in. Whether we like it or not, we are in it. So I just encourage everyone, guys, you know, put on the whole armor of God and stand. It's the evil day. It's time to put on that armor. and then. You know, just going back to the Christian contribution to anti-Semitism. Anyone who says that the Jews killed Jesus, I would invite you to read Charles Wesley's hymn, Amazing Love, okay? He says about the Lord Jesus Christ, he died for us who caused his pain, okay? We pursued him to death. That's who killed Jesus. It's the people who died, he died for. So if you've been born again in Christ, it is your iniquities that he bore on that cross. It is you who are healed by his stripes. That's who killed Jesus. All of us who have been reborn again in him. So we, we need to also think seriously about those who preach replacement theology. The Lord, as we said, he doesn't change. So can we just seriously question these things? As Christians, we are, we've let a lot of things slide. 
We've let a lot of things slide. We've let a lot of bad theologies come in. We've let a lot of ideas that minimize the Jewish people and Israel come into our theology. And I don't know why, maybe it's a misguided um, attempt to minimize the need for faith and obedience maybe, you know, but Paul is very clear in the, in the book, in the letter to the Romans, the Jews are the root, they are the tree. We are the wild olive branch that's been grafted onto the tree. And the Bible is very clear that it is actually through the Jews that we have our faith in Christ. So as a Christian Zionist, I'm calling on all Christians who are not Christian Zionists to examine the Bible and be truthful about what it says about Israel and the Jewish people. And I would also just like to thank all the Christian Zionists who have kept this fire burning. You know, it's people like you who have allowed people like me to learn the truth about Israel. And so I thank you very much. Olga, I thank your dad and I thank you for the work you've done in this regard. Um, and like I said, we need to put on the whole armor of God. The day is evil. And you know what is happening at the United Nations is evil. When we see evil, we tend to ignore it because we can't understand it. We can't rationalize it. Why? Why would anyone do something so disruptive? Doesn't make any sense. And so the mind just puts it on the shelf and says, well, I can't understand it, so I'm not going to deal with it. But we have to deal with it. We have to confront it. As illogical as it is, we have to just make a point of standing. And how do we stand? We join organizations that are standing. There's a lot of organizations that are standing. The South African Zionist Federation is able to link you to a lot of organizations. And I'd encourage all of you to go to their websites, go to Olga's website, Anne's website. And let's, let's join up, guys. You know, they strengthen numbers. And one of the things that these organizations who are standing against Israel do is make us believe the lie that we are lone voices. You know, they're very intimidating. They're very violent. They're very rough. They make us believe that we are standing alone, but we're not. There's more of us than them, actually. And then lastly, I would just like to say, as Africans, Isaiah 18 lets, lets us know that there's a promise for us as Christians. As African Christians, the book of Isaiah chapter 18 says that Africans will bring a gift to the Lord in Zion. There are people who are trying to stop us accessing this promise from the Lord. Let us not allow them to do so. So please guys, sign up, spread the word, flood social media. This is a serious, serious threat, not just to Israel, but to our faith as Christians. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Uh, very powerful. Uh, and we really appreciate you um, giving us your insight uh, as a member of uh, uh, not the Jewish community, but uh, someone who understands this issue extremely well and, um, and, and really uh, such a powerful view. Uh, if, if you are a Christian Zionist listening to this, I'm going to put Pam's email address in the comments section, Pam, with your per with permission, uh, because we'd really love to get your organizations to also be behind this, obviously your, your members as well, but uh, I do think that we need to have as many organizations stand with uh, with us on, on this, if, you, if you're willing. So I have put Pam's uh, email in. Please uh, free, feel free to be in touch if you want to engage Safi uh, on this. Then a uh, last speaker for the evening, a man who is very much uh, well known uh, for 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 this for this work and to this community and around the world, uh, and has been in many ways um, the, 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 some of the lone voice certainly in our parliament sometimes uh, and on, on the world stage in, in different places and different ways. Uh, he is Dr. Kenneth Meshu, uh, and uh, he is. Um, Mishra, excuse me, uh, and he is uh, joining us tonight uh, to to give us his perspective. Uh, Reverend, uh, is your camera on so that we can see you? Well, it says uh, the host has muted it. I'm oh, trying yeah. to unmute. Terribly sorry. Give me one moment. We're just going to see how we can get uh, the technical. Problem. There you go. Rev, try now. Uh, 
talk to the host. If you are the host, do something again. <laughs> All right, we're, gonna, we're just going to try and, and fix that uh, for them uh, in, in a moment. Um, I do apologize for that, Reverend. Um, Reverend, do you perhaps, um, all right, we'll, let, let's see. Ah, there we are. We've yeah. got you there. Uh, thank you. Um, and you, you can see us and you can hear us, Reverend. Well, I can see you. I'm not sure whether you can see me. We can see you. We can hear you clearly. Uh, Reverend Meshu, uh, from the African Christian Democratic Party, um, Hope and Glory Tabernacle, uh, up here in Gauteng. Uh, Rev, what do you have to say to us on this evening? Well, firstly, thanks, a big thank you to, to Anne and to Olga, our great la ladies that side. Um, and to you also, Benji, for chairing this session. I'm not going to be long. Maybe I'll say three or four things. Firstly, we are facing a war that is winnable. If all of us spoke and acted like people who believe that they can win the war, we definitely can. When you see a soldier walking in the streets during wartime, dragging his feet, looking apologetic, you cannot expect much from such a soldier or from, from such a person. And I think many times Jews and Christians alike they seem to be apologetic. They are not as confident as their enemies. But I must say that um, we are better equipped because we operate from love and not from hatred. And there's no way that hatred can beat love if those with love can show the love. There's no way that darkness can beat light if those who are walking in the light can make their light shine. Um, I, has, I have a sense that a number of our people are easily intimidated. We should not be, we should refuse to be intimidated by these guys. There are things that um, we need to correct as people who love Israel and who acknowledge the fact that it is the responsibility of every responsible government to defend its citizens. When people Keep quiet when Hamas attacks Israel. And when Israel responds, then they scream. Disproportionate response. We need to speak out as those who are supporting Israel. The right of Israel to defend herself. We need to revisit our strategies. Our strategies are not as well-funded funded as those who hate Israel. My perception is those who hate Israel spend much to work towards the destruction of Israel. And we don't seem to be spending as much as the enemies of Israel to defend Israel. Our coordinators, our coordinators and the programs of those who want to defend Israel Am I gone? Have I gone underground, or is it technology? <laughs> now we hear you. We hear you, Reverend. You can hear me. All right. We should make sure that our strategies are well known, and we should do our best to ensure that we increase the presence of those who love Israel. Start chapters, new chapters on universities. You go to many universities, don't see anything or any group of people that love Israel speaking out. But those who hate Israel, they are in every campus. So you ask your question, the question, what is the problem? Is it coordination, poor coordination or lack of funding? And I think sometimes it's both. We need to put our money where our mouth is ensure that we have educational programs that will be able to reach 
all university students in particular who need knowledge about what's happening in the Middle East. I can assure you that the majority of South Africans love Israel. The previous speaker spoke about, Pamela spoke about churches, charismatic churches. I would not focus on Pentecostal or evangelical churches. The majority of what's called Zionist churches, they have the word Zion somewhere. They love the word Zion. They are Zionists. They are, they are called the Zionists, even though some of them don't know much about Israel, but they are known as Zionists. So those people are ripe to be harvested. They are ripe to be harvested. So if information could be given to such people, this is what's happening to Israel. The UN is biased and yet they claim to be promoting peace and security in the country when they are part of the problem. And I think if we do not, address the problem and confront the problem will not be able to solve a problem. A wrong diagnosis will always lead to a wrong prescription. So I am suggesting that we need to say it loudly. I don't mind saying it, I can say it in parliament, I can say it in every street corner that the UN is a problem. The UN is a problem. Now, for a person like Navi Pillay to be elected to a position that requires an impartial and objective person, when it is known that she's neither impartial nor objective, and the UN is not challenged, I think we need to do a little bit more we have than we have done through. UN is a problem. And until they are told in your face you are the problem, the problem in the Middle East will not be solved. The UN needs to take their position as facilitators of peace because now they are not the facilitators of peace because they are anti-Israel. They have taken sides against Israel. This might be discouraging for a person who is not aware of the strength that we have within us. But as I close, I want to say we are facing a war that is winnable. Let's relook at our strategies. Let's look at our coordinators. Who is coordinating? Let's look at our presence on institutions of higher learning. Let's look at our opponents. You know, I, I heard something very interesting that maybe I, I need to share with you as I close about soccer. You know, I love soccer. And the uh, African competition just came to an end now. They say the goalkeeper of Senegal, um, after the match, after they won the match, he was so excited, he forgot a bottle he had with him near the goalposts. What was in that bottle? That bottle had a few, a number of players who are known to be taking penalties. He made time to study their methodologies, their strategy. How do they kick the ball? Now, if they can take a penalty, how do they do that? He studied the moves and they say he saved eight penalties during the competition. He said eight, why? Because he had made the time to learn and to observe the strategy of his opponents. So if these guys, the enemies of Israel, can have a presence in all campuses, why can't we do the same? What's the problem? So my conclusion, as I thank you one more time, Anne and Olga, for this webinar, let us revisit our strategy. We must win this war. We must expose the, the UN. And we must let people know that most South Africans, most Africans, except obviously in countries that are Islamic, they support Israel. Let that support become hot bodies. Let that support be seen. Thank you very much. And I hope that uh, our coordinators will do a little more to tell us you, how and are they improving. Certainly, certainly they'll do more with uh, that inspired address. Uh, and just, I mean, you know, I, I sort of maybe wanted to laugh a little bit, but, you know, it's such a serious issue. Just as, and also because we had a question of, of, of a university student here, who, and I hope this university student is inspired to stand up uh, for themselves on, on campuses, regardless of who they are. But but just uh, once, one 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 sentence or two sentences as someone who did suffer under apartheid 
what is your sense as a South African about, about where this is going for our history? Uh, Rev, you're on mute. My apology. Firstly, if Israel was an apartheid state, comparing Israel to South Africa, then I don't believe that South Africa would be where it is today with apartheid as it was properly de 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 defined because the word apartheid comes from South Africa. So those outside there who want to play on the emotions of people and talking about apartheid, they need to talk as people who are black. Do you know that there was a time during apartheid when uh, South African citizens were divided into four groups? The first group was white. Then you had colors, colored was a mixture of black and white. Then you had Indian. Then at the bottom was black, like myself. Navi Pillay was number three, was above me. You need to know that Navi Pillay did not experience what I as a black man experienced. She had privileges I did not have. So I know better about the pain of apartheid than Navi Pillay. And this I can say to her in her face, she's lying. I can tell in her face she's lying. So the main reason why apartheid in South Africa was so evil and had to be fought and opposed, something that caused Nelson Mandela to become a household na name. Mandela wanted the right to vote, number one. The right to go where he wanted to study, medication, education, he wanted the same rights as a white person. Mandela wanted to live where he wanted to live. If in South Africa we, were, we had what the Palestinians had, have right now, Palestinians in Israel, I promise you the world would not have known about Mandela. There would not have been any need for an armed struggle because they have the right to vote. They have the right to move freedom of movement except obviously the terrorists. I would, act against, I would act against the terrorists as even uh, uh, the Israeli leaders are acting against them. It is proper because their responsibility is to protect their citizens. But the rights they have, we don't have in South Africa. You know, the first time I went to, to Israel, my eyes were wide open looking for non-white signs or white only signs. I visited the schools. I saw Palestinian Arab teachers teaching Jewish children. It will never happen in South Africa. I went to the hospitals. I saw Arab doctors nursing Jewish. It would have never happen in South Africa. A, a black person could not teach a white person anything. You could not, if you are a doctor, you are, you act, there was a time when black people were not allowed even to be doctors. They were not allowed. So I'm saying people who are saying, uh, Israel is an apartheid state when the Arabs have all the privileges that the Jews have, those people are lying. They must ask people like ourselves who are told you cannot go there because of the color of your skin. You cannot attend the school. You cannot tell a white man what's right and what's wrong. You cannot do, do all those things. So Israel is not an apartheid state. That word is used just to play with the emotions of people, to get sympathy for the poor, for the, for, for the Palestinians. But apartheid, there is no apartheid there. I've been in Israel more than 20 times and I'm hoping to go there again next year. There is no apartheid in Israel. So it's a lie. Well, Rev, uh, we certainly you certainly didn't disappoint with that uh, answer. And we also know uh, why you're now so effective both in parliament and on a Sunday morning at the sermon. Uh, so thank you once again for your time. We always appreciate your support. Uh, thank you to all of our panelists, to Pamela, to Olga, um, and, and of course, to Anne, who's joining us uh, uh, all the way from, from New York. Uh, I really think it's been an inspiring event from a perspective of, of really understanding the threats. And once again, if I can say to people, 
please do go to Anne's website, contact us at SAF, South African Friends of Israel or at the South African Zionist Federation. We need to raise our, our voices. And as someone put um, at the bottom in one of the chats, uh, um, that uh, for evil to per to persist, we just need uh, good people to do nothing, and we have a chance to do something. Um, the we have a chance to say that this was that this thing is not going to be passed in our name uh, as South Africans. Uh, so please do join us in this program. Uh, you can see all of the all of the information in the chat, uh, but you can also be part of it, and you will be getting uh, a lot of uh, interaction from us. Uh, in the coming weeks uh, as we as we mobilize towards this effort so uh, thank you to everyone for joining us uh, thank you to um to everyone for for being part of this call and for being part of the 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 pro-israel uh community in in south africa that is working every single day to make sure not just that our country is is on the right side of the future but that the whole world is uh, as well so uh, thank you to everyone and thank you to our whole team who helped put it together tonight, Lisa uh, and David, who always do such a, a great job and all the people in the Zionist Federation office. Uh, and we hope to be seeing you all uh, on a webinar, but hopefully also in person coming up soon. Uh, there's many great days in terms of Yom Ha'atzma'ut and celebrations about what Israel is all about coming up this year. Uh, so we, we do hope that you can be a part of it. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for, for, your, for your time and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Benji. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Olga. Thank you, Reverend. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Very well done. Uh, wow. So amazing, amazing. We ran a bit long, but, uh, but too good to stop. Thank you all. Uh, thank you all for joining us. I'm going to end the meeting uh, very soon. Uh, to give you one last uh, moment to say goodbye. Bye. Thanks all. Thank Fantastic. you so much. Really appreciate it. Awesome. Good night and God bless everyone. Good night, yeah. everybody. Good night. Bye.